Hello everybody, Zone Famous here, and welcome back to the Prague Connection. We are going to be doing the worst to best, continuing the worst to best series with a very prolific neo prog band of the 80s. They were one of the competitors with uh, Marillion and alike. We're talking about the legendary IQ. They were um, very um, influential with albums such as Tales from the Lush Attic, The, the Wake, um, of course, with Ever. Subterranean was a giant smash, and then, of course, The Road of Bones is their most critically welcomed and loved album, and most in prog know who IQ is. Dad, I would love to know what you think a little bit of IQ before we start. Well, you know I don't like the label of neo-prog. It doesn't really mean anything. Not fully. Yeah, so, I don't know, they're sort of, like, more like the second wave. Mm-hmm. A pro New rock. wave of British progressive rock. Yeah. Mm. That's what it used to be called before the neo prog term was invented. Oh, mm. I didn't know that. All right, Phil. Well, I guess a brief history of my time as a fan of the band. I first got into them around 2017, either spring or summer of 2017 i first checked out ever mm -hmm. and actually um funny thing about uh the term neo prog i actually looked up what neo prog was on wikipedia one day not knowing any of the bands not even marillion at the time basically just decided hey which one of these bands should i look into close my eyes and pointed my finger and went to iq Ended up checking out the uh, album Ever and pretty much never looked back. I fell in love with it. Not straight away, but I did like it. And just over the next few years, got into as much of their stuff as I could find. And that includes live albums. They have a bunch of amazing live albums. I'd almost say some of the live albums are better than the studio out, um, recordings of the same songs. Yeah. Um, shall we begin? Phil, how about you start us off? Okay. Now, I'm going to start by saying that I don't think IQ has ever released anything that could even remotely be considered a bad album. Mm -hmm. Like, at all. Um, that being said, some albums are not as strong as others, and there has to be a bottom of the list. And... Um, Generally, IQ's discography, when people rank what they like and what they don't, what they think is their favorite, what's their least favorite, it's generally, they're not really divided on this. The, the, the favorites are pretty much universally favorites, and the least favorites are pretty much universally um, not disliked, but they're pretty much universally, you know. And I'm not rocking the boat at, at all with this one. I will a little bit later, I'm sure. But uh, Numzamo. Mm. My bottom of the barrel IQ album is Numzamo from 1987. Obviously, this is the first of two without Peter Nichols on vocals. This has Paul Menel or Menel. However you pronounce it, I still to this day do not know. Again, IQ has never released a bad album, and there are quite a few songs on this that I really, really enjoy. I think No Love Lost is a fantastic song. I think the title track is actually really cool, kind of like a mix between the more art rock sounds of what Genesis was doing on Invisible Touch with songs like Domino and The Brazilian, mixed with like the kind of world music pop the world mm. music flavored pop that peter gabriel did on so mm. that put those together that's what numzamo sounds like to me still life is a pretty good tune uh human nature is absolutely great one of their best songs ever 
I, IQ is one of the only bands I could think of where their worst album has one song that you could consider one of the best they've ever done. Yeah. I can't name another band that off the top of my head that I can say that about. Mm. And uh, Common Ground is is all right. It's a pretty good album closer. But what makes this album as weak as it is, is I don't have any issues with Paul Minnell's vocals. Um, aside from the occasional uh, lack of pitch control, mm-hmm. but he has a good, he has a really nice um, tone to his voice. He definitely has the power in his voice. Um, the issue really is the fact that this is pretty much a radio attempt album, as is the other Manel album that we will talk about. And, you know, they were on, they weren't on a major label, but they were on a pretty, uh, I don't want to, for lack of a better word, prominent independent label that had major label backing. And so I believe it was the major label. I believe it was the record label that said, all right, we're going to sign you. We're going to have you put out your music for us, but you're going to have to put out an album that could be played on the radio. And that's what these two albums really sound like to me. And there's a lot of more commercial attempts on here. There's a lot more radio friendly songs. I'm not a fan of passing strangers. Um, Screaming is okay. I do enjoy that one. But again, it's more of a pop song. Promises is, you know, obviously the big pop single on this album. Mm. Um. And just overall, the band didn't sound comfortable writing these songs or playing them. Obviously, Manel sounds fine on them, but it's not the the sound that IQ should be going for. Mm -hmm. That pretty much sums up what I have to say about it. All right. Dadger number 12. My number 12 is The Wake. No, that suffers from kind of Pretty mediocre production. Doesn't sound that great. And if you compare it to Marillion's album that year, which was script for a Jester's Tear, this is just not near as good for the same style of music. Script for a Jester's Tear was two years prior. Uh, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. That a better example, if you want to use the same uh, year, would have been Misplaced Childhood. I thought that was 86. No, I blew it. No, it was 85 if I looked up uh, Prog Archives and Wikipedia, right? So I don't have a lot more to say about this album. It's just kind of, to me, it's kind of weak and just trying to find their sound and not really getting there yet. So it was my least favorite for Wake. Okay. My number 12 is also going to be 1985's The Wake. Nothing bad about this album, nothing particularly brilliant, but the big negative and why it's so far down here is the God awful production. Even the 2010 remaster barely does a lot to help. I think the stage performance um, helps a lot better. It's a lot better when you listen to the actual 2010 version and you get to hear those songs like that. And I think the stage performers that they still play are the standout tracks for sure, but otherwise, I find it's uh, on more on the amateurish side than even its predecessor. And the production makes it somewhat unlistenable at times for me. That's just my opinion, though. Um, my standout tracks were the title track of The Wake, which I have an asterisk attached. I'm not. I think that some of the moments don't work for me entirely. Magic Roundabout minus the production is great. Widow's Peak, same with me. I uh, have a few problem with a few moments. And same with The Thousand Days. Um, I listened to a little bit of Headlong, too. That one was interesting, too, but... Um, otherwise it falls down here mostly because of production. Um, Phil, you're number 11. All right. Again, no surprises here. I'm not really rocking the boat and I'm sorry to you guys because you know what's coming. Mm -hmm. My number 11 is, are you sitting comfortably? Uh The second and last of the Manel albums. After this, he and t- both him and Tim 
Esau, Esau. Again, to this day, no no clue how to pronounce their names. Mm. But um, they would leave the band. Um, they would eventually they would tour, toy with the idea of breaking up, but circumstances that I'm not going to get into because it'll take too long mm -hmm. happened, and they stayed together. Peter came back and. They got a new bass player. We'll talk about him later. Yep. And uh, the rest is history. But back to this album. Most of my problems with this album are also the same as the last album in that it is an album uh, with a lot of radio attempts. It is another more commercial album that sacrifices a lot of the prog. I would... I could even see some people say that it sacrifices even more of the prog than its predecessor. Mm. There are still some great songs on here. I really like War Heroes. Nostalgia Falling Apart at the Seams is a fantastic um, two-part epic. Um, obviously, the 10-minute War Wrench, I think that is actually my favorite of the Manel era. IQ songs and as poppy and yeah as poppy as it is the closer on this album nothing at all I think is fantastic I love everything about that song um but again just there there's way too much pop on this thing uh drive on sold on you through my fingers Again, a, g a good half of this album is just pop, and it's not its not really a sound that IQ excelled at at all, and you know, I'm, I'm glad that this, uh, I'm glad that this sound didn't survive past this album. As good as some of the stuff is, better would absolutely follow. All right. And better came before. That's your number 11. My number 11 is Tales from the Lush Addict. I think it's better than The Wake, but it's got some of the same issues, right? It's a little bit uh, still just sounding a bit like a basement band, and but it's got the hallmark sound of IQ. It's very good. It's just not outstanding, but it's good. Now, my number 11, I finally have one on physical I can bring up, is going to be one of their more recent ones, 2009's Frequency. And this falls down here not because of production, like The Wake did, but more because of a lack of uniqueness. I think that Andy Edwards was a bit limited on here as well, and I feel like he could have done better. I know the caliber of drummer he is. He's fantastic. I just think that for what he was, he was kind of mimicking Paul Cook's style and not really implementing a lot of his own um, style into it, at least to my ears. Um, also, the mini epics, like, um, for example, The Province, uh, don't work for me as much as I would want them to. This is a decent addition to their catalog, I'm not upset about it at all. I think it's a decent listen to throw on every now and then. I'm just not getting anything from this album that I cannot find better on others. And um, that's about it. My standout tracks are the title track of Frequency, which is really good. My favorite track on this entire album, Life Support. And I think that that's a very um, Steve Hackett solo track. Very cool. Very, very good. Um, Stronger Than Friction has a lot of nice moments that I really enjoy. And One Fatal Mistake was also okay. I think that this is just not one of my favorite albums. Number 10, Phil. All right. So number 10 I don't actually have on physical media. Mm. And in fact, if we were to do this more than a year ago, I would not have actually been able to talk about it at all because up until IQ had posted their discography onto Bandcamp along with the rest of 
the giant electric P record label. Yep. Thank you, by the way. Mm. I really appreciate that. True. Wish you would release it on physical, though. Uh, yeah, just get it cheaper online on Bandcamp. It's worth they can it. Put a, they can put a physical version out on Bandcamp. Come on. Go but on. anyway, um, of course, I'm talking about Seven Stories into 98. Yep. And in addition to that, I am also talking about the original demos of Seven Stories into 8. Um, a lot of this album, I will mostly honestly talk about the demo album because I've actually listened to that more than the um, <clears throat> actually 98. But I think the big problem with this album is I mean, obviously the fact that it's essentially a compilation of a bunch of demos mm -hmm. with no real cohesion among them. And the re-recordings for the 98 version pretty much don't remedy that. <laughs> There's three songs on here that are instrumentals. Um, Peter Nichols actually on the original doesn't show up at all until the last three songs on the project. Wow. And the other two songs on the first five songs that are vocal are sung by Martin Offord. So Intelligence Quotient and Barbella Zinn are both sung <laughs> by Martin Offord. That's really cool. Yeah, and he's a decent singer. Mm. I don't know if he had what it takes to sing lead for the band. Mm. I can see why they got someone else. But mm -hmm. I'm like, none, none of the songs are bad. Um, the capital letters about like five and for Christ's sake are instrumentals and uh, they're OK, but they're not very memorable. Mm. Um, I really like Intelligence Quotient. Yeah, um, I also really like Fascination and It All Stops Here. Both of those do have Peter Nichols on both versions. Mm -hmm. uh, briefly, what I will mention uh, about the remakes is I honestly think that it's actually not as good as the demo album. A lot of the songs, they slowed down, which I am not a huge fan of, especially It All Stops Here. I don't particularly like this version of the song at all. In fact, my favorite version of both It All Stops Here and Intelligence Quotient are on the um whatever the heck it, the 1991 compilation album release that i do not know how to pronounce this name it's it so looks french. like it is in french yeah but it's sure like it the it's got most of the songs on here are with the exception of a song title from i believe the wake um sessions that was also in french that i'm not gonna try and pronounce no um every one other one of these tracks on here is sung by paul manel yeah and the, the it all stops here in intelligence quotient are actually re-released on this from a single they did in 1986 i guess to introduce him to the their audience mm -hmm. with some familiar songs mm -hmm. but uh back to seven stories into 98 another thing they would do what I really didn't like is the recreation or the like reimagining of the um, song Barbell is In. I actually kind of like uh, the original um, more. I like that um, arrangement better. I don't like the uh, like jungly world beat sounding drums on the new one. I really don't know what else to say among about on this i like listening to it um but it's it's definitely proggier than um both manel albums so that's a plus but all in all a bit disjointed but it's an interesting listen dad your number 10 my number 10 is also seven stories into 98 you know that i had not never heard this one before until we started making this list, but there's some jazz fusion elements in there that were kind of interesting. 
Yeah. Unusual to hear them doing that kind of a thing, so. In a way, it's a little bit too bad that they didn't bring that into some of their other. Albums. Yeah, I will say that uh, seven stories into eight and consequently seven stories into 98 is also probably the most musically diverse IQ album. You have anything more to say? Also, then? Yeah, it's just it. Again, it's not great, but it's good. Mm-hmm. It's a good listen. Okay. My number 10 is going to be 1987's uh, The First Appearance of Paul Manel, or Paul Manel. I like calling him Paul Manel. Um, I'm Zammo. I, along with Phil, am not the biggest fan of this album. Um, however, I will say that it's a very, very strong album. It is the first to feature Paul on vocals. It falls because of production. However, I don't love some of the material found on here either. Screaming is one of my least favorite songs they have ever recorded. Probably my least favorite. I hate the chintzy keyboard sounds. It's so, so of its time. And at the same time, IQ should never have done it. It's just god awful. Yeah, the the keyboards do sound a little bit like game showy. They're terrible. I can't. That that might be it because it's a keyboard sound of its time, and I understand them using it. I'm not criticizing them for that, but at the same time, oof, it's such a bad sound. And I don't love Passing Strangers either. Human Nature is great, but overstays its welcome for me. Um, the bangers are clear. This is a good effort down here because of production and a few tracks that just simply will never reach me. Um, the standout tracks are No Love Lost, which I think sounds like it could have been straight straight ripped off of Abacab. Um, especially the ending keyboard solo there at the end. That's straight Abacab. Promises As the Years Go By is a very Journey-esque song. It's well written. It's well sung. They did a pretty decent job, all things considered. Nom Zamo, that title track is fantastic. It reminds me a ton of Marillion. Um... Human nature is good, like I said, overstays its welcome, and common ground is nice. Number nine, Phil. All right. Number nine. I am actually shocked at how much lower you have this than I do. The Wake, 1985. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, I do have to say, obviously, this is the last one to feature Peter Nichols until he came back in the beginning of the 90s. Mm. I do have to say that I love most of the material on this album. Mm -hmm. Absolutely love it. From beginning to end, just from a song standpoint, this album is a masterpiece. Mm. I think the only track I don't particularly care for is the title track, The Wake. And that is mostly because I feel like it is missing something. It sounds like it's a song that is in desperate need of like a big chorus, a big hook. And it just doesn't have it Mm -hmm. at all. And so that makes it suffer a lot. Mm -hmm. The rest of the album, I can't say a bad thing about. Except for the production. This is one of the worst mixed, worst produced albums I think I have ever heard outside of the black metal genre. This mix is atrocious. The vocals are pretty much exclusively too quiet and drowned out the entire time. Yeah. The keyboards are too loud. The lead tone for the guitar sounds like a synthesizer. Yeah. The bass is muddy and it's way too loud. The sna- I don't like what they did with the snare drum. Yeah. Like everything about this album from a production standpoint is frankly trash. Mhm. But the songs themselves are so good. Right. Which is why I suggest anybody who can find it go out and purchase this. It is a live performance of The Wake done in its entirety 
for the 25th anniversary of this album. And the entire track, the entire track listing is just the original um, seven songs of the album. The DVD also comes with um, an encore of Infernal Chorus. The Darkest Hour and Failsafe, which is a really cool, um, really, really cool uh, bonus. But mm -hmm. the actual CD itself is just the seven songs. And you ever want to hear these songs sound not garbage? This is the way to go. Mm -hmm. All of the songs are presented very well. Peter Nichols actually sounds a lot better as a vocalist on this than he does on the original. The drums don't sound nearly as sloppy, which we'll get into more of that when I touch on Tales from the Lush Attic. But mm -hmm. the drums are much improved on this album versus that one. And that's the only opinion I'm going to get on this al on that album until we get there. Yeah. But we will get there. Pretty much what I got on here. The Wake is my number nine. It is the worst of the um, Peter Nichols era eras not including of course seven stories mm -hmm. it, it it's the worst proper iq album okay. with peter nichols on vocals but it's still a really good album if you can find this version just listen to it on youtube with the video it's free there fair all right dad your number nine my number nine is frequency mm. you would think sandwiched between dark matter and the Road of Bones. If you didn't know anything about the discography, you'd think, okay, well, I know those other albums. It's going to be this one's really going to be really good too. But it's sort of like like a limp noodle, right? It just <laughs> doesn't have the magic of those other two albums at all. I can't say any one song that I in particular don't like. I just the whole thing is kind of like not really what you would expect from that point. In their discography, it's just it's just weak. On to my number nine, which I don't have on physical either, um, is Tales from the Lush Attic, released in 1983. This is a fine debut. They found their style immediately with The Last Human Gateway and decided to perfect that ever since. They basically just decided to say, you know what, we're looking at The Last Human Gateway. We're just going to perfect it throughout my, our entire career. That's what we're going to do. And then they did. And I think that this is proof that a band can just work immediately right on the money, and it works. It just This is proof. This album is proof. They found their sound immediately. They knew what they wanted to do, and they did it. Maybe it took a little bit more time to perfect it, but man, is this a solid first effort. It's amateurish, sure, but I'm not expecting um, that amateurish sound to not be there on a debut album. I'm just not expecting perfection off the bat. Incredible start, though. I will say that mostly why it comes down here is because of production. Songwriting fails a tiny bit here and there. Not very much, though. The Last Human Gateway was a um, an obvious banger. It had a few moments that I thought were a little bit off for me, but it was mostly production that brought it down. Through the, through the corridors is cool. I didn't find it my favorite myself, but pretty cool. Awake and Nervous is a classic. My Baby Treats Me Right Because I'm a Hard-Loving Man All Night Long is one of the longest titles in prog history, I think. But it's really good. I love... Uh, yeah, the title's life. longer than some prog epics. Basically, I love the showmanship uh, of uh, Martin Norfolk's flashy little parts on there. Very nice classical piece there. Really good. And then The Enemy Smacks is another classic that I have my issues with, but... I think it just came came down to just uh, figuring out how to make it a little bit more concise. And they would have had a perfect album right off the bat. Production aside, and a few moments that I'm not a huge fan of, this album is fantastic. Let's move on to our number eight. Okay, my number eight. Oh. And this is the first moment where I get some people might be mad at me. Well, the second one, after putting... But, you know, then again, you guys put the wake even lower than I did. So uh, we're just going to get into it. 2000's oh. The Seventh House uh. is number eight for me. Mm. Don't let how low it is 
on this list for you. I think this album is, for the most part, fantastic. The Wrong Side of Weird and the title track are obviously the two best songs on the album. Amazing from beginning to end. Both 12 to 14 minute epics and they mm -hmm. kill. Yeah. Um, I also really like Erosion. I like Zero Hour, Shooting Angels. Absolutely fan absolutely amazing songs. And then there's Guiding Light. <laughs> this is where they this is this is where the unsubscribes happen. Uh, yes, Guiding Light. I know it's a favorite of the band. I know they play it pretty much every concert. You cannot buy a IQ live album without Guiding Light being on it. And it's just not a great song. It's okay. I think the first like three minutes and 30 seconds are fantastic are phenomenal and then it goes into that jarring really shitty sounding industrial keyboard which leads it into this proggy section that is not bad on its own but it could have been implemented so much better the transition to it just did not work mm -hmm. it's a complete mood change with like no warning mm -hmm. And I'm also not a huge fan of how they reprised the melodies from the seventh house toward the end of this song. It's just, th there's plenty of great moments on it, but it, they, they didn't, they didn't glue it together properly, mm -hmm. but it's still a good album. If you want to get into the band um, if you don't know anything about the band and you want to get into them, want to see what there's about, I think yeah. this is honestly a fantastic starting off point. Mm -hmm. um, I will also get into another fantastically star fantastic starting off point a little bit later in the video. Yeah. But for now, my number eight is the seventh house. Dad, your number eight. My number eight is ever. Ah. Uh. Which I guess is very. Uh, Highly praised for the return of Peter Nichols. Yep. Which is fine because he's 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 a, he's great. I think he got stronger a little bit more in recent years. And you know, this album is not as good as its predecessor and uh song wise it's kind of like a little bit middling and not really any standout moments for me, but it is it is it is good. It's good. And it is a like what Phil was saying. I I, I think Ever is a good place to start. It's a, it's a good uh, starting one. Th that's exactly the other one that I was going to say. It's a good so. starting one. It's it's kind of got their. It's like a nice neat package of what IQ sounds like. It's a good. It's a solo down. Yeah. All right. My number eight is going to shock a lot of fans and. I am going to shock myself with this one, but my number eight is 2019's Resistance. And, uh, yeah, I know. A little bit shocking, eh? This is really good. I I have my issues with it, though. My thoughts on The Great Spirit Way since its release are that it doesn't have a, much consistency to it. The... It just changes so um, erratically. It's not sticking to the same tune almost for more than two minutes, which is fine. You're going to find that on um, other prog albums. Like, you may even hear, like, people say that uh, Great Spirit Way is kind of like Relayer in a way, but I'm just, I'm not even sure about that. Um, it's not my favorite thing. I, I find, I respect it, but. I think they could have done a little bit better. That's my that's my general consensus with this all the epics on this album. I don't find that any of the epics work for me perfectly. I think For Another Lifetime is probably the best one on the album. But even that one fails to reach me the entire way through. Um 
However, the first disc has some of the strongest material the band has ever recorded, including a bunch of moments on the epic. Um, fantastic production. I really hope that they can roll with this. Plus, I gotta love that artwork. It's really nice. It's it's. Clean. Oh yeah, that's one of the that's one of their best album covers it's... and one of their best logos. Somebody else brought this up, and I do have to echo their sentiments real mm -hmm. quick. For a band with a name like IQ, it is a very very simple name, two letters, mm -hmm. and to not have a steady logo that you. Keep using throughout your career makes zero sense to me <laughs> yeah. for a band like this. I mean, go going back to this album, this logo, what the hell is wrong with this? It's Why isn't shirt. this being used on all of them? Yeah, that one could have been used on all of them too. I mean, like, I get it. It is kind of their de facto logo that they use a lot on their merch and yeah. to a certain extent on some of their live albums. Mm hmm. But, like, come on, just a little consistency here. Pick one. That's all I'm asking for. Yeah, but basically, that's my thoughts on uh, Resistance. The standout tracks for me were A Missile, which, to me, it doesn't do anything that uh, the title, the the uh, not the title track, From the Outside In uh, didn't do on the Road of Bones. Very similar format in terms of what it's potentially, what it's trying to do. Rise is fantastic. I love Paul Cook's drumming on that, which I forgot to mention in the last one. I didn't think Tales from the Lush Attic had fantastic drumming, but he's gotten better now. Um, Stay Down is fantastic. Absolutely beautiful. Alan Pandria sounds like it could have been off Dark Matter. Shallow Bay is absolutely beautiful. Same with If Anything. Absolutely love If Anything. And for the most part, I am okay with fire and security. And I'm okay with uh, for Fallout. And I have my love for moments of for another lifetime. But we'll move on to number seven. Phil, your number seven, please. All right. Well, my number seven is Resistance ah. from 2019. So um, they're back, back to back Resistance. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I I really love this album. It really it I'm not going to say it took a while to finally click because I liked it pretty much from word go. But like it really took a little bit for me to like actually be able to truly absorb it and like really get into it. But once I did, my god, this album is amazing. Like, almost from beginning to end. It, it's not as immediate of an album as previous IQ um, releases. It's oh. not as hooky. It is a lot darker. It's probably the heaviest they've ever been. It's probably yeah. the most prog metal they've ever been. I mm -hmm. wouldn't say they've gone full prog metal. But, although, judging by um, the... Uh, little bit of, of new material that we got on the most recent uh, live album box set, uh, we might be getting more toward that, which I'm not complaining about. But um, obviously this is the second one to feature Neil Durant on keyboards. He does an amazing job. Um, the one issue I have with Neil Durant, though, that I wish they would remedy, dude, please, for the love of God, Get a better piano sound. Uh -huh. get a get a piano sound that does not sound so fake. But other than that, getting into the material on this album, a missile is killer. Although I do have to say, I don't think it should have opened the album. I think it should have been a little bit later in the first disc. I think Rise would have been a much better album opener. Mm. Um, and Rise is a fantastic song. I love S Stay Down. I, to this day, have no idea how to pronounce the song that comes after that. Um, but you're about to look it up. Pretty sure it's just Alan Pandria. Yeah, that. 
Um, it's okay. I think it sounds a little bit more like an interlude than an actual song. Yeah, and I'm not a yeah. huge fan of that. But I mean, probably would have been better if it was left off of the album or developed further into something that sounded more complete. Uh, but it is what it is. Uh, Shallow Bay is really good. Um, I have said before that if anything sounds like it is their hold on my heart, except it's Darker. actually shows it shows Genesis the way to make a softer, more, for lack of a better, I guess for lack of a better term, smooth, not quite smooth jazz like hold on my heart sounds, but smoother. It, it basically shows Genesis how to make a song like that in the way that they should make a song like that. Mm -hmm. If anything is really good, and it's actually one of the songs that um, my keyboard player for the ba for my band um, really gravitated to on this, to the point where we're going to be doing a cover of that when we start playing shows. After that, For Another Lifetime, which is my favorite song on the album, period. I love everything about it. Mm -hmm. uh, going into the second disc, The Great Spirit Way, I enjoy it quite a bit, but I do share your sentiments on there not being a lot of consistency in the track from like moment to moment. They could have um, arranged this track a lot better. Mm -hmm. uh, Fire and Security, I think, is really good. Perfect Space is pretty good, and Fallout is magnificent i love fallout no complaints there great way to end the album fantastic epic mm -hmm. love it all in all it's a really great middle of the road iq album and when middle of the road is still fantastic that's a hallmark of a great band true not a single bad release from this band i'll say dad you're number seven my number seven is The Seventh House. It's another one of those IQ albums that's kind of like it's a good starting point because it's just very solid, sounding like what IQ is supposed to sound like. And it starts good right f start right off from the first track. It's got the, that descending synth arpeggio, which is kind of what gives you the atmosphere for the whole album. Yep. Kind of like a better version of Ever oh. to me. Mm. And that it continues on in the very same writing style, but you know it's a little bit better. Maybe maybe it's you know that keyboard's right up the, right up off the top of the album sets so the tone, and you know it's it's just a, it's a solid album. Mm -hmm. Like it a lot. Back to you. All right, my number seven is definitely going to piss a few people off, and it is a classic. And everyone loves this one. It is heavily uh, critically acclaimed. It has multiple live renditions on DVD and on CD. It is 1997 Subterranea. And I think that this is a wonderful addition to their catalog. However, uh, as much as I know that this is the much-loved double album of Subterranea... I find that this album kind of falls under the criticism that most people give from Tales from the Topographic Oceans. It suffers a little bit of being too much material for a single album, too little material for a double for me. This absolutely has some of the best moments in the band's history, bar none. Some of the best. However, there is too much for me. This album could have benefited from a trimming in my eyes, moments from Fail Safe, Fail to Reach Me, and full songs like Tunnel Vision don't work for me. Even the epic The Narrow Margin, I think, could have used a little bit of trimming, just a little bit in some moments. I don't think it warrants the entire 20-minute uh, full um, conclusion. It could have been 18 minutes even, and it could have, to me, would have worked a little bit better. But that might just be my 
opinion, a uh, great listen. I would absolutely listen to it again. It's fantastic. It's iconic, but it's not my favorite. The standout tracks are uh, Overture, which is fantastic. If you listen to uh, Garden of Dreams, the opening is very similar. So very similar albums to open back to back very shortly after Flower Power and Subterranea are very funny in how they open up the albums. Subterranea, the title track, is great. Sleepless Incidental is fantastic. Failsafe has fantastic moments. Infernal Chorus is great. King of Fools is absolutely stellar. The Sense Insanity, great. State of Mind, I loved that song the moment I heard it. It was fantastic. And I will say this. My favorite thing about this album is that basically the entire second disc is flawless. Um, I think Breathtaker is brilliant. Capricorn is fantastic. The Other Side, brilliant. Unsolid Ground, marvelous. Somewhere in Time, also a wonderful. High Waters, great. And, of course, as much as I have a few parts where I'm just tuning out just the teeniest bit, the Narrow Margin is still a classic, and I think it has so much emotional depth in it that I can't really be mad at it when it goes on a little too long here and there. Great album. Absolutely stellar. Love this thing. It's great. I just don't think that this is anywhere near one of their masterpiece works. So, we're going on to number six. Phil, you're number six. All right. My number six is the debut. Mm -hmm. Tales from the Lush Attic, released in 1983. Now, I will have to say this right from the bat. If it wasn't for this version that I have right here, the 2013 remix, this would be possibly lower than The Wake. Oh. Maybe not, maybe, maybe just like barely above it. But the production and mixing on the original is horrible. Actually, you know what? I'm going to... I'm going to say it's it, it would still be better than The Wake, and I'll tell you why. Yeah. Because I give it a pass because one thing that this also includes is right here in the booklet for the album is a story on how the album was made. Oh. And if you don't know how the album was made, I will give you a brief rundown. Yeah. Basically... IQ, prior to making this album, had no experience in the studio at all. The only recordings they even made were seven stories into eight, which was done at home on a four-track cassette machine. Now, they could not afford to make this album, so they had to... And they, until they found an ad for an, a special deal on recording time. I'm not going to get into what the deal was other than essentially they had five days to make this thing oh. and they had to borrow money from the drummer's dad to do it. This entire album was recorded and mixed by the band with no help from a producer. The only help they had was an engineer that didn't give half a shit about anything the band was doing Wow! and was completely unhelpful the entire time. So they had to record this entire album in a recording studio that they had absolutely no experience in in five days. <sighs> really, actually, it was four days, and they had to mix it on the fifth day. Oh, my God. Wow. So the fact that they made an album in four days by themselves, and it turned out this good... Especially with the remix, you can actually hear just how hard they were trying. Excuse me. I think The Last Human Gateway is one of the best things I've ever done. Just bar none, beginning to end, this, uh, this song is a masterpiece. With the exception of the drumming and, to an extent, Peter Nichols' voice. He was definitely... Uh, let's be honest. In the 80s... Um, 
I believe I've been quoted as saying in the 80s, Peter Nichols' voice is... Peter Nichols' pitch control is about as shaky as a game of operation between Muhammad Ali and Michael J. Fox. Go oh, fool. That's awful. But <laughs> yes, but it's accurate. Yeah. But um no. admit like he does okay. He's definitely better in the studio than he is live. Uh which is actually impressive considering again, the vocals were all recorded in one day. Mhm. So, so yeah, like it's still like very impressive. And then like yeah. through the corridors, you know, two minute song. It's all right. It's a little bit punky. Really, this whole album is pretty punk when you think about it. Yeah. Because, you know, they had no record label. They went into the studio completely without any experience. And they had such limited time. Of course, it was going to be flawed. Of course, it was going to have a bunch of problems. But they somehow managed to make the most accidentally punk prog album ever. <laughs> like, and of course, Awake and Nervous, you know, big, Positive. symphonic. Some of the keyboards suck, but not the actual playing, more like the tones. Run like through the some 80s. Of the synthesizer tones. It wasn't the 80s. It was the fact that uh, Martin no. Offord was using the same keyboards that he was using to play live, no. and he could not ma maintain them. They were, in right. they were in dire need of service that he could not afford I, to do. I was more just talking about the, that Awakened Nervous reminds a lot of Man for Man's Run Through the 80s, I believe is the song. Oh, okay. I didn't hear that part. They're All right. very similar songs. It's funny that I believe they were released <laughs> in the same time. No. Again, my baby treats me right is you know awesome. really cool, um, very frantic piano piece from Martin. Does a fantastic job there. Yeah. And unlike Zoltan, I don't have any issues with the enemy smacks at all. I think this might. I think that might be the best song on the album. Mm -hmm. I absolutely love everything about um, the enemy smacks, and especially like the last third. After that really crazy part, after the second time you hear the vocals, it goes crazy and then it sinks into this killer groove. Do, 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 do. I love that whole part, with the, especially with the guitar solo. God, I love that song and I love this album. Yeah, I give it a pass for so much because I know what went into this album and how much time they had or more accurately didn't have to yeah. make it and of course that alone would get it up to higher than the wake not much higher than that but what saves this album more than anything is the 2013 remix because it fixes a lot of the problems with the mixing it makes the drums actually sound really good they're still sloppy as shit but they sound great yeah and it even fixed some of the problems with Peter Nichols' voice yeah. um, with some of the lines he was singing because they actually found out that some of the alternative, um, t some of the alternate takes that he recorded sounded better than what was put on the original album. So they just used bits and pieces from those. So um, I talked way too much on this, but I had a lot to fucking say and I could have said a lot more. You want to do your six then, Dan? My number six is Resistance. It's interesting to me that, you know, Numzamo and Are You Sitting Comfortably have a bit of an 80s Genesis influence and that they brought that back for Resistance, you know? You can hear the influence of the late 80s, early 90s type softer Genesis stuff and I mean, actually it works, so they must really love that era of, of Genesis. Oh, yeah. So, again, it's not worthy of the top five, but, you know, it bodes well for their upcoming releases. This is a very good and solid album. Mm. It's fantastic. All right. So I'm going to go with uh, the other album that I don't have on physical. This is the last one, and it's impossible to get. So 1998's Seven Stories into 98, the re-recording of the demos from the very early 80s, reimagined and I think taken to another level here. 
This is the most musically diverse experience by IQ in their entire discography. They do jazz fusion. They have a Genesis ass track that just has a lot of a classic I IQ feel. Same with just a couple of just classic IQ tracks in general. Some instrumental bangers and more. This album has uh, a couple of songs that I don't love myself. The Barrel Is In is not my favorite, and For The Taking are not, are not, eh. They're not my favorite. Uh, but otherwise, this album is pure gold. Um, standout tracks, capital letters. Uh, about Lake 5, I think is fantastic. Intelligence Quotient is awesome. For Christ's Sake is really cool instrumental. Fascination is fine. I think there are parts of it that I think could have been taken out as well, but that's just me. It all stops here. It's fantastic. I understand. I can see totally why they do this song live. And I love Eloco Bellinici, which just is really, really cool. Fantastic moments. I think some of the best Michael Holmes guitar work on that song and some of the best in, in some of uh, IQ's discography. So my number, uh, that was my number six. Fill your number five. All right. My number five is 2009's Frequency. Yeah. Obviously, this was a very different lineup from the albums that came both before and after. Martin Offord was gone. Uh, Paul Cook was gone. We got Mark, or we got Mark Westworth on keyboards and Andy Edwards on drums. Mark Westworth does a really good job, both live and in the studio on this album. I do really love his keyboard work throughout the entire thing. Uh, this is the most guitar-forward um, IQ album up to that point. And I would say the heaviest as well, up until, you know, what came after. Mm -hmm. Like, this was really kind of the... This was kind of the album that signaled where the band was going. They were kind of getting a little bit further away from further away uh, from the um, very obvious Genesis influence and going a little bit heavier. They were going a little bit more modern with this album, and I think it worked. I really love the title track, Frequency. Um, I like life support, although I wish that there were more vocals on it. Mm -hmm. I am not always a fan of when IQ has mo has songs where like the first part is like really soft and voc with vocals, and like the second half is like this crazy instrumental. It can be cool. They've done it before, and it works very well a lot of the time when they do it. I don't think it worked as well on this album, but I do still think it was really good. Stronger Than Friction is one of my absolute favorites on this album. I think my absolute favorite on this album is actually Riker Skies. I love Riker Skies. If there was a song on this album that I would love to sing a cover of live, it would be this one. Aside from that, uh, One Fatal Mistake is great. Uh, the province is really good. Closer. I really can't say I, I really can't say any bad things about this album. I like, and it's amazing. Like for how different this lineup is compared to what's from what was from before and what came after, it still sounds so much like IQ. Mm -hmm. I think that's honestly pretty impressive. Although I do have to say, uh, one bad thing I have to say, going um, back to the discussion about um, IQ's logo constantly changing, this is probably the worst one they ever had. But, you know, if the, the worst thing I can say about the album is I don't like the logo they used, no, no complaints. I'm good. I like it. All right. Dad, you're number five. Number five, I'm going to go with Subterranea. I think the, uh, it's, I mean, I, I, I love almost all of this album. When it came out, I was a fanatic for it. I loved it. But you could say one thing is criticism about it is that it, it is too much trying to 
copy the Lem Lies done on Broadway. It's like kind of obvious that that's what they're trying to do, right? Mm. The lyrical themes are pretty much the same, and the, the entire organization of the album is pretty much aping the Lem Lies Down. But still, it's worthy of the extent. top five. It's a great album. I like it a lot. Martin Orford's keyboard playing is some of the best he's ever done, so it's fantastic. All right. I think uh, I'm going to go with, uh, for my number five, I'm going to go with the Turn of the Century, 2007th House. Uh, this album grew on me a ton. I think that it's got strong epics. I think the long pieces are its strong suit, for sure. The album combines the songwriting of pre-2000s IQ with the production and sensibilities of post-2000s IQ really well. I think where it falls off is sometimes this album tries to do the industrial metal thing that was really prevalent at the time. Um, the keys... Uh, if, like Phil brought up on Guiding Light, the transition from the nice melodic piece into the proggy bit is the most egregious um, example of this. Terrible, terrible sound. I don't love the sound. I think it's too predictable of that era and what was going on at that time as well. Very cool ideas in there, though, and I really do think Guiding Light is good. Um, although... When it comes to production and overall quality of this album, I'm not complaining at all. This is great. The standout tracks are The Wrong Side of Weird. Erosion is has a moment or two that I don't love, but it's still great. The Seventh House is fantastic. Zero Hour is absolutely gorgeous. I love the sax. I think it, I'm, it was one of those two that has the sax. And Guiding Light is absolutely great. Minus that horrible transition. Number four, Phil. All right. My number four is 1997 Subterranea. Mm. I love this album so much. But I will say, whenever I listen to it, I normally listen to a live version. I think um, some of the songs, they when they play them live, they have them at a faster tempo, which I think benefits them greatly. I think some of the songs on the studio version drag a little bit too much. Perfect example would be the title track as well as the overture. I think the I think listening to them on the actual recorded version, it's a little bit slow. I'm not a huge fan of it, but when listening to them live, the energy is there, and that saves it. I mean, not that the recorded versions are bad at all, but you know, they benefit from the added energy of the tempo speeding up. Mm -hmm. and obviously, this is a concept album. I'm going to disagree with the notion that this is too much for a single album and not enough for a double album. In fact, I think my big issue with this album, which keeps it from being higher on the list is that for a story-driven concept album where the lyrics are supposed to be portraying a story, there are way too many instrumentals on here. Mm. Like, um, obviously, Overture, you know, you can... There's no reason why that shouldn't be there. It's a great um, way to introduce a lot of the musical themes that you find all over this album. Yeah. And it is a fantastic blend of all of them. Um, True. I don't know if the um, instrumental section at the end of Tunnel Vision that um, puts it into or that um, segues into um, Infernal Chorus needed to be as long as it was. It's beautiful and I love it, but it could be a little bit shorter. And I love the transition into Infernal Chorus. I think that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Um. State of Mind and Laid Low, I don't think should have been individual songs. I think they should have just been one song to close out the first disc. There's no reason in a concept album that's trying to tell a story through the lyrics 
that you need to have two instrumental songs back to back. I'm sorry. There is no excuse for that. And after that, the other side, again, that song should have either been developed further and had lyrics added to it, or it should have been left off of the album and replaced with something else. There's way too many moments on this album that are instrumental for what it's trying to be. Mm -hmm. Having said all that, everything else about this album is fucking amazing. I absolutely love um, the title track, Subterranea, Sleepless Incidental, Failsafe, Speak My Name, Tunnel Vision, Infernal Chorus, King of Fools, Very Dark and Foreboding, mm -hmm. um, Sense and Sanity. I absolutely love that keyboard riff that plays throughout the thing and how it the melody is a reprise of the song Provider, just further developed. I love that so much. Going into the second disc, of course, Breathtaker is phenomenal. And speaking of Breathtaker, that moment where the percussion and stuff drops out and it's replaced by the percussion loop that we later hear on the narrow margin, that certainly took my breath away. Mm. I love that whole song. Capricorn is really great. I love the saxophone on it. The other side, if they actually did release any song as a single, the other side would have been the perfect choice. Mm. Um, somewhere in time, absolutely great. There are some keyboard moments on there that I think they should have chosen better um, keyboard patches for. But other than that, I've got no issues with it. They do choose better sounds for those live, which is another reason to listen to Subterranea, the concert. Mm -hmm. You can either find it on Bandcamp, and you can also find the um, version from 2011 that has the current lineup with Tim Esau back in the band um, on Bandcamp as well. Both of them are really solid. I suggest buying them. And of course, the narrow margin. Ending out the album with the big 20-minute epic. And I have to disagree with Zoltan um, completely. I don't think they should have cut anything off of this song. I love this thing from beginning to end. It is probably my favorite IQ epic of all time. Mm. Absolutely killer from beginning to end. The vocals are great. I love the different parts. I love the transitions into the parts, even the more jarring ones. The big proggy section toward the, like the second half of the di of the song is, god damn, the energy in that is infectious. Mm. And then the way it ends on the reprise of the second part on the acoustic guitar, it's very sad, somber, melancholy, and it hits so well. Mm. After everything that came before it. I could talk about this for so much longer than I have, so, but I'm going to stop here. Absolute masterpiece. Dad, your number four. My number four is Numb Zemo. You know, Zoli, we had this, con we had this conversation. Mm -hmm. some, some of how you feel about an album has a lot to do with how you first encountered it, it and where you were at the time, right? I really loved, and I still do love IQ, I've never had a problem with uh, Paul Menel's vocals. For the uninitiated, I guess, to my ear, he sounds a little bit like, and I don't certainly don't know the person's name, but whoever the guy was who was singing in the band, The Outfield, which had oh, a lot of... I, I know, I, I know exactly what you're talking about, and now that you mention that, I hear it, but I cannot for the life of me remember his name either. If you, But mm -hmm. if you put him back to back... You know, you could see why they would think that Paul Mendel had a voice that could sing on a, a single that could get on the radio. And, you know, Zoli, I also, I never have a problem with the idea that they were trying to write some, you know, songs that they thought at the time would be commercial songs that could be played on the radio. I mean, you know, it's paramount to your survival. You want to make a living, you have to have a record deal, and you got to sell some records. You can't sell nothing. It's very romantic notion to think that you can just be an underground band that nobody cares about, and somehow you're going to make a living at it. 
I don't think that's true. So I give them I give them a lot of slack for that and I and I, I mean I again I, I like Paul Mendel's vocals and uh I like that crossover into the more uh commercial side of like you know, like the eighties Genesis or the eighties, yes. I like that. That's my cup of tea, so I like that about it. I mean, there's some solid prog songs. The first couple of tracks on this album are very good, solid prog. You can really hear the. To me, you can you can a lot hear the more the influence of the Steve Hackett solo albums of the late of the late seventies, and then obviously you can hear that that sort of eighties Genesis sound here and there. But I I like that kind of a mix, so I like it a lot. But I think it's one of their classic albums. It always has a soft spot for me, so. You know, solid number four. All right, so my number four is very special to me. It'll always have a... Yeah, it's, it's, it's special. This is a classic among fans, and it's a classic to me. 1993's Ever. This is... It just has some of my favorite tracks ever written by this band. Darkest Hour is fantastic. Fading Senses. A Lot of Further Away is fantastic. And this album is the definition of 90s neo prog. It really, it just is. There's no better album that encapsulates neo prog of the 90s more than ever did. And I will always have a soft spot in my heart for this one. Strong. Only complaint I have is a few moments on further away. Could have been shortened just the teeniest, weeniest bit. As well as a few tiny sections that I find were a little unnecessary, but it's like 95% there, 98% there. Just the teeniest little bits could have been cut, and I think it would have been a little bit better. Just trimming because some parts go on a little bit too long. Um, also, Out of Nowhere is basically just a Duke track, so there is that, too. Um, I love it, but it's pretty obvious. Like, I mean, let's be honest. I mean, that's basically, like, turn it on again. Um, good, good shit, though. Um, standout tracks, Darkest Hour, Fading Senses, Out of Nowhere is great. Further Away has a, some, a plethora of fantastic moments. Leap of Faith is wonderful, and Came Down is probably one of the best ways to end an IQ album in their entire discography. Don't come at me. Um, mm-hmm. There you go. That's my number four. Phil, your number three, please. All right. My number three. The third best IQ album. 2004's Dark Matter. Oh. Uh, what can I possibly say about this album? I'm at a loss, quite frankly, because there's so goddamn much. This album is fucking perfect from beginning to end. I love every goddamn moment on this thing. Mm. Sacred Sound, amazing, beginning to end. And that's uh, my former bass player, Mitchell, who you might be seeing guest on this when we do another band. This is probably his favorite um, IQ song. Uh, he, Whenever he comes over, like, he would i would play this song on the from my computer and he would play along with it on bass and he does a really good job with it too absolutely fantastic song i love every moment of it red dust shadow killer a little bit dark a little bit sad but you know it's iq so you know they're not exactly known for happy music but um absolutely great you Never Will, I think, is fantastic. I love the vocal melodies on there, mm-hmm. the keyboard solo, the guitar solo. I love how I almost said heavy it is, but it's not really that heavy, especially not cons- um, compared to what they would do later with Frequency and the Road of Bones. And it- We'll get to that one. Mm-hmm. But Born Brilliant, I think, is stellar. I love the melody that 
the riff that would get recycled in um harvest of souls and recycled is not a bad thing because they do it absolutely incredibly both songs and of course you know harvest of souls what 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 the fuck can i say about harvest of souls that isn't going to take up half an hour yeah i know uh so you know what don't don't listen to me talk about harvest of souls just go listen to harvest of souls and you would see i don't need to say a single goddamn thing because that song speaks for itself absolutely killer another masterpiece from beginning to end i don't have any issues with this at all i don't have any issues with anything on any of the top three and so this is only the third one there's still two more all right dad you're number three please well, I'm going to continue on with the theme I had for my number four. And for uh, me, at number three is Are You Sitting Comfortably? Again, I, I really loved the uh, Nom Zamo sound. And when this one came out, I also loved it. So, you know, it, it's kind of like the foundation for me of IQ albums. And as I've told you before, we were in the uh, at Metalworks in Mississauga in... 1989 and 1990 and we were recording our debut album mm-hmm. the kite and terry brown was producing us and he had produced are you sitting comfortably and we were we had conversations with him he said you know i just came from england and i produced uh the latest iq album yeah and uh at the same time i'm not sure if he gave me a cassette copy of that of this album but I know he did give me a cassette copy of uh, the It Bites album at the time, which was uh, Once Around the World. Mm-hmm. A little bit of 70s prog, but a little bit of 80s AOR sensibilities. Yep. Which you need to have a record deal, as I know full well. But he said, you know, you'll, you'll, just, you'll love this band. I never heard of It Bites before, but I'll listen to that album... Uh, once around the world and became a f- fanatic for them as well. Mm-hmm. So it was a good time, good time right around the time that we were recording our debut album. Mm-hmm. Cause you know, it was, are you sitting comfortably and once around the world, those were the backdrop, right? Mm-hmm. Plus of course there was eighties. Yes. Albums like big generator and stuff. Yeah. Which had big influence because they were doing stuff that was froggy enough, but, but commercial enough. Yeah, that you were gonna get, you were gonna get played, and maybe sell some albums. That was the sort of, uh, you know, the the space at the time where you were trying to write stuff that was still prog but had yeah. enough commercial value because record companies actually like to make money. Right, that's why they exist. Right. So yeah, are you sitting comfortably for me? Is number three. It's I think it's fantastic and one of the classic ones. All right, my number three is going to echo the same sentiments as Dad. It is 1989's Are You Sitting Comfortably? This is, in my mind, their most underrated album in their entire discography. I can't help but love the charm of this album. Uh, The production for the 80s is fantastic. Mental had it absolutely smacked down on this album. The mini epics are the absolute high points for sure. But the short songs are also relatively good. Only song I have any issues with is War Heroes. It's an okay rocker. Not bad, not excellent. This album is excellent, however. Uh, No real notes. Uh, Standout tracks. War Heroes is okay. Drive On is... uh, It's kind of uh, that same uh, kind of feel that... 80s Genesis was kind of doing at that same time. Nostalgia Falling Apart at the Seams has a lot of those still proggy tropes and a lot of the Steve Hackett solo career aspects, especially on Nostalgia. Sold on You is the big attempt at being a pop song, but I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's all that much popular. I would say it's actually less poppy than Promises. 
Through My Fingers is a kind of a soft rock tune that works really well. It's well written. It's well sung. It's well produced. Orange is obviously f- fantastic. There's no notes on that one, and nothing at all really well um, ties this album up in a bow, and really just closes it off really nicely. So, here we go. Now we're getting into tough territory. Number two, Phil. Before I do, I will have to say that if there was a song from the Manel era that I would want to sing a cover of live, it's War Inch. Without yeah, question. Song. I do absolutely love everything about that song. It is one of the best songs they've ever done. Burn on. Now, despite you know having it so low on my list. Um, now, my number two is going to be Ever mm-hmm. from 1993, and I have the big 2018 remix box set that yep. has the bonus disc. Obviously, this is the first album with Peter Nichols back in the band after he was gone for two albums, and this is also the first one to feature John Jowett on bass instead of Tim Esau. And I will have to say on this real quick that one thing that this lineup of the band has that the current one without Martin and John Jowett lacks is a strong presence of backing vocals, right. especially live. I think the backing vocals from those two on most of the albums that they have made with that lineup is phenomenal the harmonies that they could provide are just missing on the current with the current lineup and if you listen to songs that they have recorded on this album particularly that they've played live if you listen to live releases of with like the darkest hour and with fading senses you know that strong backing vocal harmony yeah. is just kind of not there and it's very noticeable mm-hmm. and but this album is fantastic the darkest hour starting off on the right foot with a 10 minute would you consider that a mini epic or a full yeah, epic yeah mini epic yeah yeah it's kind of on the cusp a little bit but yeah it's a mini epic it's absolutely great i love every moment of it from beginning to end it starts off really strong and then it ends beautifully with that piano yeah um fading senses like i said when talking about um the song life support off of frequency i am not always a fan of what when iq does the softer piano driven or keyboard driven mm-hmm. um Parts with the vocals followed by an instrumental section, second half. Um, Fading Senses does it a lot better, but it's not my favorite. Although I do love that song. I think they do it a lot better on Leap of Faith, especially the instrumental section. I fucking love how they composed that. It is so good. Yeah. Of course, um, Out of Nowhere. If I had to pick a if I had to pick a song gun to my head that is the weakest on the album, it is out of nowhere. But that's not because it's a bad song in any way, shape, or form. It's just that the rest of the album is just so much better. Mm. And you know, obviously further away, fucking amazing epic, 15 minutes of pure bliss. I love the vocals. I love the keyboard work. Michael Holmes riffs. Ugh, everything about this song. I don't even I don't think it needs to be cut down at all. I think it's perfect exactly how it is. And of course, like um Zoltan said before, I don't think there is a single better track to end an IQ album on than came down. Maybe the narrow margin would be a better ending song, but for like a shorter, yeah, for like a shorter song, 
It's good. She can't get much better than came down. True. I love it, especially how it ends on the guitar solos. And if you do listen to this version, it comes with a bonus track of the freaking came down the solos that got away, mm. which almost makes it sound like a Satriani song with slightly worse production and a slightly weaker guitar tone, but it's still excellent. I don't have a single bad thing to say about this album. It was the first album I ever listened to from IQ, and it holds up so well. Mm -hmm. All right. Dad, your number two, please. My number two is The Road of Bones. Mm -hmm. I think this is kind of the classic album of the the, the latest stage of their career and uh it's obviously it's a classic IQ album mm -hmm. i was listening to it today in the car and uh i thought the track three and track four and track five all rolled together and you probably could have just had that as one song so mm -hmm. without walls into ocean and 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 until the end mm -hmm. you probably could have just said okay that's just one track because they all just flow seamlessly from one to the next. Yeah. And they could have got it. Right? Those could have been the parts of a a concept piece. That's what it sounded. I always thought it was that. Until I looked at it today, I didn't really realize that it was these are listed as three different tracks. In the yeah. It sounds like a long concept piece, which would be, I guess, around 27, 28, 29 minutes, something like that. Mm. It'd be more than, than that. that. Because... Uh... Without walls and until the end together it would be thirty minutes long. Yeah, more than that. Like what? Without walls is like nineteen minutes, and until the end is like twelve minutes. Yep, yeah. So about thirty-one minutes. So it would be about thirty-seven minutes. Yeah, it would. Yeah, I think that would work well. I mean, that's what it sounds like to me, anyway. So. Yeah. You know, I will say that you know I think Peter Nichols' uh, vocals on the last like. Decade, decade and a half have continued to get better. Oh yeah, which, he's which absolutely. Is little, which is a little bit surprising. I don't think he's a young fellow, is he? <laughs> no, he's like mid sixties. What is he pushing? Yeah, he's like in his mid to late sixties. Hmm. So that's that's quite a an amazing thing that he can keep getting better. So so Zoltan number two wrote a bones. <sighs> All right. So here's my problem. I didn't actually have a definitive one and two. I still do not have a definitive one and two. I don't have a single way I'm going to figure out how to toss these two up. But I'm going to have Flip to. A coin. I'm going to have to. This is the most torturous process I think I've gone on for in this entire um, series of worst to best in my entire channel's history. Because I love both of these albums so much. But I think I'm going to have to go with 2004's Dark Matter. Oh, I hate doing this. I hate doing this. I hate doing this. But at the same time, there's really no good answer here. Both of them are going to hurt my, my, my heart. Um, this is, this album is essentially perfect. It's basically a mirror, a foxtrot, and I think that Scott said that on his ranking of, of IQs. Yeah. Um, which is, it's just true. It's very, very true. I mean, Sacred Sound is basically a Watcher of the Skies, um, mirror. Um, you also have songs like Red Dust Shadow, which is absolutely great. It is kind of a, in that same vein as well. You Never Will and Born Brilliant are both very similar tracks, but they work just about as well as they should. They're the tracks that needed to be on the album to fill up the space, but the, but the way that they do it, I would kind of say that they are nearly filler tracks, but they are so good. They are still such well-put-together songs. They didn't need to be there entirely. It could have been a 40-minute album, and it would have been just as good. But I'm very happy that they added You Would Never Will and Born Brilliant because those are excellent tracks. Fantastic. And how on earth can you go and talk about the entirety of this album without bringing up probably the best epic in their entire discography of Harvest of Souls? That is... 
Yeah. On any given day, I may say it's the best IQ epic ever written. I will probably say it's the most concise. It's the one that knows what it wants to be the most. For it has dedicated sections. And what it wants are, to be is suppers ready. Yeah, it's it is literally it is their <laughs> suppers ready. Basically, it has a lot of that uh, energy on it. It's dark. You got a lot of reprisal, almost sections like some of Harvest of Souls sections feel like they're echoing other ch- sections of the other songs on this album in a way, in some regards. And it's such like a, more brilliant. It's such a well pieced together. It's concise. 52 minutes long. I mean, hell, that is a concise, well put together album that just knew what it wanted to be from beginning to finish. The second you hear Sacred Sound to the moment you close off Harvest of Stoles, it is essentially perfect. That album, I can't name a single problem with it. It hurts me to put it at two, but that's where it is. All right, Phil, you're number one. All right. Real quick before I do, I. Do have to mention, I forgot to when I was talking about Dark Matter. I think the best lyrics on the entire album are actually on Born Brilliant. Mm. I absolutely love Truth. what the song is about. I love how descriptive it is. I love how it paints a picture of this dude that is just a total fucking scumbag. Yep, pretty much. But like, it, mm. but like in a way that it's almost relatable, like it's kind of a like you know somebody exactly like what this song is describing, and if you don't, maybe it's you. <laughs> yeah. Like, like mm, it's well written. <laughs> Absolutely. So? Peter Nichols is a very underrated lyric writer. Yeah, very good lyricist, yeah. But anyway, we knew this was coming. There was almost no way that this would not be number one. For at least two of us. I knew going into it, Zoltan, that you and I would share the number one spot. Yeah. And of course, I'm talking about 2014's The Road of Bones. Yeah. Yeah. Big lineup change from Frequency, which was already a big lineup change from Dark Matter. Obviously, Mark Westworth didn't last in the band. And neither did Andy Edwards. Paul Cook came back. Um, Frequency would also be John Jowett's last album with the band. He would leave. They would get Tim Esau back. And this would be the introduction of Mr. Neil Durant, who is a phenomenal keyboard player and every bit as good a fit in IQ as Martin Offord was. Absolutely phenomenal. His keyboard writing on this thing is fantastic. Again, I just wish he would do something about that piano. Mm-hmm. But obviously, um, I have the two disc edition, which is the the actual first. The actual album is just the first five songs that can be found on the first disc, with the second disc being forty five minutes of additional music. Yeah, they could have just released this as a double album, Genial. like Whole Hog. And it would have had the exact same effect because the material on the bonus disc is, excuse me, the material on the bonus disc is every bit as good as the material on the actual album. Yeah. From the outside in, I don't think there could be a better way to open an IQ album than this fucking song, other than maybe The Last Human Gateway. Mm, Yeah. I love it. It's heavy. There's a lot of Mellotron on there. Neil Durant's synth work is fantastic. I love the guitar riff. I kind of wish the guitar was a little bit louder than the bass on this song, but it's all right. Yeah. And of course, the lyrics from Peter Nichols are they're dark. They have a serial killer vibe to them, which cool. there's a the first three songs have that vibe to them. Of course. Like to the point where like people often mistake this for a concept album about a serial killer from the perspective of the serial killer. Mm -hmm. And I think that is an amazing concept for an album. I think they should have done that. Like for the whole thing. Yeah, right. Uh, There are some songs like I don't think Oceans really reflects that very well. No. 
And I don't think until the end reflects that at all. No. But like the first three tracks absolutely does. Yep. Obviously going into the road of bones, the title track, absolutely stellar. I love that little, I love that bass riff. I love the lyrics. I love how it, when it, when it comes time for the instrumental break, the fucking guitar comes in and it is loud. It is heavy. It is fucking powerful. And I love it. Yeah. You know, obviously without walls is beautiful from beginning to end. One of the best epics IQ has ever done. Yeah. Fantastic keyboard work from Neil Durant. Um, Oceans, fantastic again. Very kind of mellow. Yeah. The piano sound on here is it's still obviously fake, but it's not as glaring as it is in other parts of this album and on Resistance. Uh, but it's still really it's nice. Um, Peter Nichols' vocals are very soft. They're almost vulnerable a little bit. I yeah. think it works very well. The lyrics are great. Mm-hmm. Until the end, I have not actually listened to this song a bunch compared to the rest of the album. I've, I've definitely listened to it. It's really good. It's just probably the closest I would say to a least favorite I have on this album. Mm-hmm. But it, it, it's more to do with the fact that the rest of the album is just so fucking good. Mm. And um, I think that out of the supposed concept that people often mistake this album to have, this one fits it the least. So it's a little bit kind of jarring in a way mm-hmm. for me. Mm. Um, then we get into the second disc, Knucklehead, very heavy. The lyrics are very... Very dark. Yep. I fucking love it. Um, thirteen twelve overture is all right. It's an in, uh, that is that's the instrumental track, I believe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I haven't listened to the second disc in a hot minute, <laughs> and since it's a bonus disc, I don't count it as much as right the first disc. Right. So it, it could honestly be weaker than the first disc and it would still not it would still not make it lower on the ranking for me. Yeah. But the fact that it is so good with tracks like Constellations and Ten Million Demons and Hardcore. Yeah. So many fucking great moments on all of those songs. True. This should have been a full on double album. Yeah. It should have been. And the fact that it's not, and it's just the main album is just the first disc, is a little bit of a downer. That is the closest thing to a flaw this album has, and that's saying something. Because when there's the when the flaw of an album is there's not enough, that's a pretty good flaw to have, honestly, because true. it's so fucking good. Yeah, true. I don't know if I could say anything else about this that wouldn't make this longer than it needs to be we're probably gone on for quite a while now but as it is but obvious number one bro to bones easily well deserved um spot on prog archives uh the title track is their second most listened to song after promises on spotify and uh it's all well deserved this album deserves every bit of the acclaim it gets yeah dad you're number one well, through process of elimination, I guess it's not going to be a surprise that it's dark matter. Very sort of keyboard dominated, which, you know, I love. And, and as you had said, it's kind of got parallels to Foxtrot. Definitely for the the uh, Genesis fans who, you know, sort of lost their, you know, that side of the prog sound in yeah. the early 90s, this is exactly where you start and you say, okay, here's, now I've got my, I've got that sound back in my catalog, right? Yeah. These are the guys, these are the guys who've carried on the sort of gen- Genesis tradition of that type of English prog. Yeah. 
and Dark Matter is the high point of their, with Road of Bones being second, obviously. It's, it's incredible, but I think this was the, the high point of their discography. Not that doesn't mean that they could, could not still have a higher point to come, I don't know. But uh, this is definitely, for me, the high point of the entire thing. All right. So I think I will continue in the footsteps of where uh, Phil left off, and my number one is going to be 2014's Dark Ma- uh The Road of Bones as well. <laughs> <laughs> it really wanted to be Dark Matter. It really wanted to be Dark Matter. But it's The Road of Bones. I'm going with The Road of Bones. This album is so, so, so good. I have nothing better bad to say about this album at all. Like, none. The epics are its high points. But there isn't a single wasted second on any of this album. I It's concise. It's well put together. Even the bonus tracks are fantastic. What more can I say? Um, From the Outside In is probably the best opener for an an album I would say Sacred Sound being probably number two for me it's really really tight it's really really tight Sacred Sound is a really well uh, rounded opening track as well Um, The Road of Bones the title track is absolutely stellar it's so dark it's got a lot of meat on it it's really really powerful Without Walls is probably my second favorite epic maybe number one on certain days totally depends I think that almost all the um, moments found on Without Walls are fantastic. I love how it opens up, sounding a lot like um, yeah, um, Fading Lights but off of uh, Genesis's album uh, We Can't Dance. I love that. So reminiscent of, of uh, Fading Lights. And then it gets into the meatiness that is IQ's just darkness that you could find easily as well on uh, Harvest of Souls as well. But it's a little bit more experimental. It's a little bit more wandering the prog fields. I mean, even there are moments on that album where I'm just like, okay, I'm listening to Flower Power by the Flower Kings or something. This is weird. It's a very diverse uh, prog epic. Ocean is gorgeous. Goddamn gorgeous. And I'm going to disagree with Phil. As much as I do think that there are moments on there that could have been a little bit more concise, I still think that those moments work very well until the end is probably uh, came down and until the end are tied for the best ways to end an IQ album, bar none. Until the end. Hmm? I have no issues with the album musically. The reason why it's as kind of low or not not low but if it was like gun to my head and say pick the worst song on this album yeah it would be until the end simply because like the lyrics don't Mm -hmm. match that supposed concept that the first three songs had no i suppose not but neither did ocean either that's it neither did ocean either yeah i will say this until the end the reason why i think it's the best is just because of the fact that it ends the vocalized section where it's really heavy and proggy just ends really satisfyingly. Then you pick it up with a beautiful piano piece from Neil Durant and Michael Holmes doing a little bit of uh, nylon uh, classical guitar over that. Gorgeous. And what Peter Nichols sings over top of that is just so emotionally climactic. It's gorgeous, beautiful, beautiful, unbelievable. So much emotion at the end of this album. I will probably say that the last two minutes of Until the End are probably the most emotional way to end an IQ album. That's what I'll say. Yes, it's so, absolutely. So pretty. It is probably the most beautiful two minutes in their entire discography. That's my personal opinion. It's just one of the most uniquely beautiful parts in any IQ track I've ever heard. I don't know what it is about the ending of Until the End, but it's so, so lusciously gorgeous. I don't know what it is. Oh, yeah. Plus the bonus tracks, Knucklehead is fantastic, like you mentioned. 1312 Overture is interesting. Really weird. Got a lot of that natural IQ uh, instrumental feel, but it's pretty cool. Yeah. Constellations is so good. It could have been on the final album, too. 
Uh, Fallen Rise is pretty cool. I don't remember it fully, unfortunately. That's just because I didn't listen to the bonus disc before recording this. Um, 10 Million Demons I remember because that one's basically their answer to Mama. The song Mama by Genesis. It is, it is Mama. <laughs> it is IQ Mama. IQ Mama. That's the song. IQ Mama. Smart Mama. You're not wrong. It, it, it's it's mama man <laughs> that's what it is it, and, you're not wrong no 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 i'm not i know i'm it, not i'm sure they know IQ, i'm right too it's iq prog metal mama I'm, I'm sure they know it too i'm sure they know they know there's no way they don't and if they don't i'm st- and if they say no we don't you're lying don't don't you dare you're lying <laughs> you're liars i won't have it but um also hardcore there's so many moments on hardcore that are some of the most incredible musically moments that they've ever had. So many great moments on this album that could have it could have been a, a second disc. They could have formatted it. It, it should like have that. been a it should have been a double album. It could have been. It very well could have been. I it don't should know. have been a full on double been, album. Yeah. Had enough material to do a double album that was kind of like in the vein of the 2012. Uh, Echo Olin self-titled which was basically just um, a 30 minute album and then another 30 minute album to basically make one double album but it's a really cool album I love this album The Road of Bones is my personal favorite it could change on en- literally any of uh, a given day I could have eh, if we recorded this tomorrow or the next day I probably put a, could have put Dark Matter as number one but that is my list Thank you guys very much for uh, coming on and doing this IQ Worst to Best. It was fantastic and fun. It was a pleasure as always. Oh, I think we're good here. What do you guys think? Should we close it off now? Yep. All right. Go ahead. Thank you guys very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like, share, and subscribe. Thank you all very much for watching. And as always, we will see you in the next one. Peace. IQ's on cruise to the edge, and I'm so happy.